In this video, I am going to show you how we are turning our wastewater, our black water from our toilets into abundance and food. I am going to show you how a very simple design is helping us in one of our projects in one of the poorest places that I've been um, turning waste into food and shade and a safe place for kids to play. I am going to show you and tell you why and how my aunt killed a lion and I'm going to show you how we used waste resources to build a swimming pool for our children for less than 200 US dollars. Let's go! It's still an early morning on the farm and uh, I'm thinking about what the wise man said to me. Only two ways to change the world. And this was in fact a military trained doctor scientist from NASA that told me this. He said the first thing you have to do is go camping with the kids. So that's taken care of. The second thing you have to do is use waste resources as uh, and turn that into production and uh, and turn that into profit. And so um, today I'm going to show you how we do that. And so the first thing we have to do is select a site. And as you can see on this site, this is where our sewage runs over. And uh, as you can see with the wet spots over here. We can uh, we can divert this into the two different spots, and so we're going to divert this into these two spots here. So let me give you a mid-project update. So all of the water from the air and from this little hill and from the roof and all of that runs through there. I don't know if you can see. Many many moons ago, water used to run there. Okay, so now it runs through there, comes down here. Hits this little berm. I'm just making a little ramp there for Oma to pass, so we need to do some groundwork there still. Dissolve uh, natural depression in the land here. And so it will fill up here. I'll run against this berm all the way to the back there. We will have some holes and some um, sweet potatoes and things, keep slowing it down and keeping it back. After it gets to the back there, we are now removing the sticks for the sheep. We'll make the area bigger. It runs in there, comes down here. This little berm will then be extended to the corner post. It runs down here, again slowed down by holes and sweet potatoes, etc. And then eventually makes its way out there. What do you And the hard set. Two things. Um, we also are busy doing a project in the township, um, very similar to this one. I want to show you that one. And um, then the other thing is at the end of the video. I'm going to give away something for free and and the reason or the person that gave us the ability is to these two people so last week I mentioned somebody bought me a coffee they found the link below the video they clicked and they bought me a coffee and then this week on the previous or well, this two last two weeks there's two other people one person that was named Ross he bought three coffees and then some person that decided to remain a nonny mouse, he bought 10 coffees and to them it might not mean a lot but to me it means absolutely the world. 10 coffees allows me to do this project here, it allows me to feed my family and my workers um, papayas and sweet potatoes and it allows me to spread permaculture into the townships. Um, so for those two people I really want to say thank you so much for this project that you see in front of you. This we can, uh, is only possible because of you. I really, really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. So this is Matthäus. And this is his house. Matthäus is one of the guys that's more, most interested in my permaculture things. And so we decided to put a system up for him as well. We actually had a, quite a good laugh about all this mulch that we collected in town. Because as you can see around here, it's part of the culture 
to remove everything and burn everything. And so Matthias's parents lived here for a long time. As you can see, this was them. Jesus life. November 25th is when they moved in. And so recently, Matthias got a wife or a lady. And uh, his parents moved to the north and so they had access to this house. They don't have any running water yet. And they also don't have a toilet yet. They have to go to one of the neighbors to use the toilet. I can't help them with a the toilet at the moment, but let me show you what they have. So yeah, we are busy digging a toilet for them. Or he's busy digging one for himself. Um, over here. I don't know if you can see how deep that is. It's massively deep. But that can actually be something nice to add to um, maybe put some big trees around as well. So in order for Matthias to get water, he has to walk to that little tap there. I hope you can see that. And then push a tag against it. And then he gets the tap opens for a minute. And then he gets water and he brings it back here. So a quick update. Some of his friends came to to help as well. And so this hole is about 60 centimeters deep by a meter and a half. And so we're gonna add all of that mulch, this little mountain of mulch that you're just gonna remove all the plastics from it and then put it in there. And now we are building a wall or a little arm to catch more water to go that way. And although it is true that we struggle with extreme poverty in this area of the world, I almost want to say some people in the world are <coughs> struggling with extreme wealth. Our biggest struggle, the real struggle, is happening between our ears. It is a cultural struggle. It is things that we believe to be true, but not necessarily true. And it takes people like Matthias, people that's willing to be laughed at, and being laughed at he is. His friends can't believe that we brought all of those leaves and doing this hole and making this silly thing. And so it takes people like him, and I salute him for this, to be laughed at and to see the bigger vision, to think that an area like this can be transformed from absolute poverty into a place where his kid can play in the shade and can be out of the sun, a place that can be abundant with food. So behind the shack, this is the system that Matthias designed for himself. We dug a pit that will now be filled with mulch. Um, he's thinking of maybe making it bigger. Behind the pit there's one tree, same there. There is no berm because we don't want to build a dam so close to the shack. This water will then run off, fall in here, the water comes from that side and because the pit is a little bit deeper, fills up and it waters this tree. He will keep on watering it until um, they are nice and strong directly and then indirectly in the mulch so that the roots can spread out. On this side, this is the final part of the project. So the water runs from all of those yards through here, in here, into the mulch pit and it feeds these five papaya trees and it allows him to sit in the shade and for his children to sit in the shade over there. Okay, so um, as you can see, we installed this pipe from the black water tank here. It's been running now for a, couple, a day or two and uh, you can see how far the water has pulled up in the soil. It falls about 40 centimeters, but it pulls up all the way. Now, we did the same there, and we are going to do the same there. Uh, we just need more pipes. But I quickly want to show you something. This drum is now what we're going to install. So there's a top, there's a hole for the pipe to come in, and then on the sides, 
there's those holes. Okay, so come on. Okay, so now we install it like that. Okay, we just mark my phone. Sit down, Jimmy. Not my knife out, and in this file. And so we fill up the the bottom. And uh, the reason why we have this pipe standing out like that is because when you have water running out of a pipe and you have living things around it, the living things really wants to get its roots into that pipe. So the reason why we don't just put it straight into mulch is so that the trees don't put their roots into the pipe and block it. So we're going to fill it up and uh, I'll show you now what it looks like when we're done. As you can see now the pipe is inside and we put the semi-composted manure around it. But this can be leaves and the pit can be bigger. Um, so if you go check on the link that I share at the bottom, I'm going to share more detailed plans of these projects and it's completely for free. Um, go check it out. I have a niece, I think that's the right English word, making some drawings for me. And then I'll write a little bit um, on how these things work exactly instead of telling you a story. So these little sad papaya trees I bought from a lady in the north. She sent me an SMS and said uh, they cut out off her water. And so I've never met her, but I bought some trees from her before. And I said, listen, um, I'll send you some money and then send me whatever trees the money buys. So I sent her what I had and she sent me these trees. And you can see that they went through some rough times. But hopefully, hopefully now they will recover. Now I want to tell you a story. And if you know my videos, you know this is the part where I start ranting about what happens, what happened in my family. And uh, if, you know, tell you all story. Um, subscribe, like, and I'll show you that project again in six months. And if you are here for my story, thank you so much. I like telling you stories and I really hope you enjoy it. Um, by the way, subscribe to David the Good. He commented on one of my videos and he was sort of somebody that I looked up a, a, a long time. Um, said to my wife when I started the channel, I want to be like David the Good and I can't sing like him. But go and subscribe to him, he's a cool guy. Uh, anyway, so the story is, <clears throat> it's a story, it's a, it's a damn story damn good story in fact it is so good that it is about two dams the one dam is right behind me and the other dam was built about 80 years ago now about 90 years ago uh, first, let's say 85 years ago there was a movement of Dorsland trackers it was a part of my um, tribe that moved from Angola to Namibia and they were given land here and they moved if you have with dire, dire um, circumstances. And my grandfather and grandmother were both working for the government. So those people were given land and then my grandmother and grandfather were sent up um, to move into that area with them and to support them. He was working um, something in, in parliament and she was um, a trained school teacher. So she moved up to go and be a teacher for, for these people. And uh, they came from severe poverty, starving from hunger and death and poisoned by the locals. And it was, it was a terrible story. But anyway, long, long story short, they moved into the wilderness. And it was so wild that later on she told a story about the first two or three weeks they were sleeping in a tent on the farm that was um, given to them by the government for them to, to look after. And while they were sleeping, they woke up and the elephants was right on top of them eating out of the tree that the tent was underneath. And they woke up and before the dog could wake up, they grabbed him around his nose and uh, to keep him quiet. And they were sitting there the whole night while the elephants were eating in the tree around them. Because if the sta dog started barking, they were scared that the elephants would tramp trample them. 
and so that was that was quite a quite a story uh sorry there's somebody coming you're making me shy <laughs> <laughs> and so <clears throat> um another example of how rough it was is later years my my father's sister who then passed away later on um she was sleeping outside with her husband outside of a caravan and then the lion jumped over her over her husband and attacked the dog that was next to you to them she jumped up and shot the lion and i grew up with that lion skin lying in our house she stitched up the dog and he survived and so it was rough 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 areas now my grandmother became pregnant um after a, a little bit of living there um, my grandfather helped her build a house and uh, then while she was pregnant with my father she already had five kids um, my grandfather passed away he had an accident with a drilling machine and then he passed away so she was alone in the in the wilderness with an unborn baby and six kids or five five other kids then he was born and sorry i just quickly want to turn this off uh, he grew up he was about six years old when his, his sisters and brothers were all went to boarding school and my grandmother decided that they need a dam in one of the camps now they didn't have a lot of labor but they had a windmill there and so every morning the windmill mill would just sort of push the water onto the ground there was no reservoir for it and so every morning early she would wake up she would take him he was about six seven years old they would walk there and she would build this dam big rocks with her own hands and then he would go and she taught him how to make traps and he would kill these little pissant birds and then at night they would put them in the in the coals and then they would eat or they would clean them and then they would eat the ones that he that they put in the in the pot that morning with a watery sauce on some some rice and potatoes and then the next morning they would put the pot on the fire put the next birds in go work for the day and then at night come back and eat the story and then the day she finished she picked him up put him on the dam and uh in the wet cement and up until today his two feet footprints are there and so this story i grew up with and i saw the footprints i was there once and uh one christmas about a year ago it was quite hot we were in this area and we thought about buying a um, one of those prefab pools and for us it would work out about 150 us dollars and so i realized that with 150 us dollars you can buy um 30 bags of cement and i thought to myself what can i do with 30 bags of cement and this story about my my grandmother building this dam was in my in my memory so i said to my wife i'm not going to spend this money on this pool i'm going to build this dam standing right beside behind me and so between me and the kids we uh we decided we we're going to build it and we collected all the building rubble in the felt and we placed some posts on facebook and some posts on the local whatsapp groups that we would remove all old bricks and old building rubble and everything from people's yards and little rocks and sand and so all of that we did and uh it was about the 22nd of december when we started and then we worked alone for about four days me and the kids and they were very keen on getting a swimming pool so they lifted bricks and we got pavers and we got old building rubble and then i got some help and uh, the guys that um, building guys that can help me because i realized that this project's going to kill me um, i have some breathing problems i don't know if you realize that in some of the videos but yeah so so we build between me and the kids and then two, two helpers, we built this dam behind me. And then when we finished, I placed them, I placed their feet in the cement and I wrote the date. And so we swam the first day, um, was the 30th of December. We slept here, we camped here, we had the New Year's Eve here camping with the kids. And so I hope that one day the story that my grandmother told me and this story of me building the dam with my kids in seven eight days is a story that they would be able to tell to other people 
Now we finished this dam in two, with $200. So it was a little bit more expensive than the prefab pool. But the community came together and they gave us bricks and they gave us um, building stone and they gave us steel, old steel pieces that they are lying around. In here in the base, there's some car steel, you know, for the springs of cars to make the base stronger. And so we, um, we build this from nothing. So the moral of my story is that if you're willing to use waste resources and if you're willing to use work hard and if you're willing to make mistakes, because I didn't know if, if you can build a dam with pavers and if you can build a dam with steel that comes from cars, um, if you're willing to fail and if you're willing to be laughed at, then you can go a long way. And so that is the end of my story and that is the end of my video. And I really do appreciate you guys watching. I feel um, insignificant sometimes or when I realize that people from around the world watch my videos and I really, really insignificant is not the right word. I can't find, but I, I, I feel mind blown when I realize that people from on the other side of the world is watching my videos and joining me for my journey. And I really do appreciate it. As always, I work for comments. So please leave a comment and I hope you have a wonderful day. That's the end of my story. <laughs>